Hello, my name is Michael Lambert and uh, today I'd like to talk a bit about um, our Home Secretary Priti Patel. I think this, this video is likely to be a bit longer than usual so I, I hope you can bear with me because I think we should all be very, very concerned about this this woman. She is really quite, quite dangerous and quite, quite frightening. To begin with, she uh, a bit of a bio. She uh, her parents had come to the UK from Uganda in uh, in the sixties. Uh, in Uganda, they were shopkeepers and they set up some shops in the UK. Seemed to have done quite well. I'm not sure if they'd have qualified for entry actually under her uh, brightest and best only uh, uh, qualifications. But uh, anyway, uh, she. Uh, she went to school in Watford, she went to a, a comprehensive school. She then went to the University of Kiel, where she studied, uh, um, sorry, Kiel University, where she studied uh, economics, and then she did some postgraduate studies at the University of Essex. After that, she went and worked for a year or two in the, uh, for the referendum party in their, in their press department. Then she went to work for the Conservatives in their press department for a couple of years. Then she went to work for uh, a firm of... Uh, a, a sort of PR company where she seemed to be working most of the time on, on one, one particular contract which was British American Tobacco where she seemed to be um, um, she seemed to be uh, lobbying uh, MEPs uh, presumably to persuade them not to vote against uh, against smoking or to bring in uh, um, um, restrictions on smoking funnily enough later on as an MP she voted uh, against uh, smoking bans and she's voted against uh, uh, selling cigarettes in plain packets. In 2010 she was elected the MP for uh, the constituency of uh, Whittam in, uh, in, in Essex, a constituency she's represented ever since. In uh, 2012, together with Kwasi Kwarteg and Dominic Raab and Liz Truss, she wrote a book um, called Britannia Unchained, in which uh, basically they, uh, they, they, it was a very right-wing um, 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 book in which they, uh, they advocated reducing the, uh, the welfare state and, uh, and they did use the famous, now famous uh, expression that uh, British workers were some of the idlest in the whole world and only seemed interested in uh, football and fashion, I think it was, or pop music. <coughs> Excuse me. In uh, 2015, um, David Cameron appointed her as uh, uh, Minister of Labour in the Department of Work and Pensions. Not long after she'd been appointed, uh, one of the staff left, saying that uh, she'd been so bullied by uh, Patel that she was, she'd had to leave and she was going to sue the department. Shortly after that, she was awarded £25,000 in compensation. £25,000 of taxpayers' money in compensation for Patel's bullying. But Patel remained in, in office. When uh, Theresa May became uh, Prime Minister, she was, uh, she was uh, uh, given a, a position in the Foreign Office where we, she was the um, Secretary of State for... Um, excuse me, I just have to check... Secretary of State for International Development, that's right, yes. While she was in that position, she um, was again accused of harassing staff and bullying, though no legal proceedings were threatened at that time, but this was again, uh, came up later on. Uh, I should say something about bullying, actually, because it's against the Ministerial Code, pretty obviously, but bullying is very very nasty it's it's really unpleasant we all know how there's trouble with bullying in schools and how concerned uh, parents and educators are about it and it, it's not only in schools it's, it's in it's in the workplace uh, it's where somebody who's got some power some authority or some physical presence uh, um, intimidates or, or, or makes the life of someone uh, someone who does who has less power makes their lives absolutely miserable and we know it, it leads sometimes to suicide and you have to wonder what what makes somebody a bully. I mean, just how awful a person have you got to be to be a bully? You know, it's sadistic, it's, it's, uh, it's cruel, it's horrible, it's heartless. No decent person can be a bully. And uh, if someone is accused of bullying, on one occasion, there's never an excuse for it, but you can always sort of say, well, maybe there were some, some, some circumstances, some, some sort of 
explanation why they, they bully this particular person. But this woman, Patel, she's a serial bully. She's been done for bullying uh, uh, three times in three different government departments. But I'll go on about that a bit later on. Now, whilst uh, May was the, uh, well, sorry, I'm sorry, whilst Patel was the Secretary of State for International Development, she went off on holiday in August 2017 to Israel. She went with a guy called Lord Pollock, who was uh, chairman of some sort of uh, Anglo-Israeli Friendship Society, and uh, they went off to, to Israel on holiday. And whilst they were there, she had meetings with, she had 12 meetings with senior Israeli government officials, including one meeting with the Prime Minister Netanyahu. Some of these meetings were set up by the Israeli ambassador in London, but the British ambassador in Israel knew nothing about it. The British embassy in, 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 in Israel knew nothing about it. The Prime Minister Theresa May didn't know anything about it. In fact, she actually had dinner with uh, Netanyahu some time later, and even then she didn't know that uh, Patel had had a meeting with her when she was in Israel on holiday. Boris Johnson was the Foreign Secretary at the time. Now, this all came out, it probably wouldn't have come out if it wasn't for the fact the BBC found out about it. And uh, there was a bit of a row, and uh, Theresa May called in uh, Patel to ask uh, what, she, what, what was this all about. And somehow or other she seemed to manage to explain it to way that she didn't get sacked on the spot. But afterwards she was interviewed by The Guardian, and... Uh, she gave a statement, and I'll, 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 I'll read it to you. It's all in her normal, um, you know, sort of ignorant, um, semi-intelligible um, gibberish that she talks, this sort of management speak. But this is what she said. Boris knew about the visit. The point is that the Foreign Office did know about this. Boris knew about it. I went out there. I paid for it. And there was nothing else... To this. It is quite extraordinary. What she's saying is it's quite extraordinary that anybody should think it extraordinary that she went on holiday to Israel, had 12 meetings with senior government officials and one with the Prime Minister and didn't mention it to anybody. She thinks that's extraordinary. Anybody should think that extraordinary. And then just listen to this sentence here. This is from the woman who is now our Home Secretary. It is for the Foreign Office to go away. She's working for the Foreign Office. It is for the Foreign Office to go away and explain themselves. She's caught having secret meetings with the Israelis, the Israeli government, and it's up to the Foreign Office to go away and explain themselves. I mean, what utter garbage. The stuff that is out there is it, as far as I'm concerned. I went on holiday and met with people and organisations. As far as I'm concerned, the Foreign Office have known about this. It is not about who else I met. I have friends out there. So. Now, of course, this is again a breach of the Ministerial Code. <clears throat> but the question really that does come out of all this, and it's quite an interesting question really, is this. To what extent was Boris Johnson involved in all this and what were they doing? How come, under Boris Johnson, her, his uh, Secretary of State for International Development was having these secret meetings with a foreign government without telling the Prime Minister? What was going on? Did something go on that uh, resulted in uh, Patel being the Home Secretary? As soon as she was appointed, as soon as, 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 as uh, Johnson was uh, elected as uh, Prime Minister? And now she's untouchable. He won't hear anyone, anything against her. She has his 100% confidence, whatever she does. Now, as I say, when, when, when Johnson became Prime Minister, he made in 2019, he made her uh, Home Secretary. She failed to declare after becoming Home Secretary that she was still earning £5,000 a month for five hours of work for a firm called uh, Viasat, uh, although she then resigned. But uh, while she was earning that money, that was again a breach of the Ministerial Code, but 
Patel, so that's okay. I think that's about five times so far I've mentioned she's broken the ministerial code. In February 2020, that's February last year, it, um, it emerged that she had tried to get rid of her principal private secretary, a guy called Sir Philip uh, Rutnam, and uh, he complained that she had been uh, getting staff to gang up against him. Um, he was her, her, her most senior civil servant in the Home Office, uh, and that uh, he, she, she was plotting to get rid of him, and that she was bullying, that she was a bully, and she was just intolerable. He resigned, and he threatened to sue. Uh, as it happens, a Cabinet Office inquiry was set up to look into this, these allegations of bullying. And it was set up under a guy called uh, Alex Allen, and he investigated. He investigated not only the accusations of uh, bullying in the Home Office, but also in the uh, Department of Work and Pensions and in the Foreign Office. And he found his conclusion eventually was that uh, she was guilty of bullying in all three departments. Boris Johnson read the report, announced that he had 100% confidence in uh, Patel, and the matter was closed. Back to normal. Now, Rutman said, uh, OK, he was going to sue the, uh, the Home Office. And it was agreed that there would be a, a hearing. It was take, due to take place in September, that's a couple of months' time. At which, of course, Patel would have had to have uh, given evidence and it would have been revealed that she was a bully, but it would be very embarrassing for her. And so to avoid all this happening, uh, in March of this year, Sir Philip Rutman, Rutman was paid £340,000 compensation and £30,000 for his costs in uh, compensation for her bullying. So we've paid out, the taxpayers paid out now, £370,000 plus £25,000, that's nearly £400,000, £395,000 out of the public purse has been paid to compensate people for this woman's bullying. And she's still in place, she's still Home Secretary with the 100% confidence of the Prime Minister. Yeah, she really is, really is unpleasant. Anyone who is, as I said before, uh, such a bully, such a serial bully, has got big issues. There's something wrong with this woman. She, uh, she's so illiberal. She's just as conservative as you can be on everything. She wants to bring back capital punishment. Can you believe this? 2021, she wants to bring back capital punishment. There's a famous clip on, 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 uh, on YouTube of Ian Hislop and her on uh, Question Time <coughs> a couple of years ago and uh, Hislop was pointing out the fact that you know, what happens that you hang somebody who's, uh, who's innocent, found to be innocent afterwards and her response was well you just have to be very careful before you hang them. I mean she criticised the England team didn't she for taking the knee and then said people who boo them that was fine no problem what's wrong with that. And of course, she's got in on the, uh, or she's got involved in the PPE stuff, isn't it? I mean, it's all too, 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 too good. It's just uh, too good for these uh, senior ministers, isn't it? The opportunities with this PPE stuff. There's a guy called Samia Jassel who worked for um, Patel, helped her, and so on. He's a friend of hers, and uh, he's also stood twice as a Tory candidate, but he hasn't, as yet, obviously, hasn't been elected. Now, he had a friend who's a sales manager for a firm called Pharmaceuticals Direct. This is a company owned by uh, two people, both called Patel. I think, um, no, no connection. I think one of them has 46 directorships, the other has 160 directorships. But anyway, they're, uh, they own this uh, Pharmaceuticals Direct company. And they've been trying to get a contract to supply some masks to the NHS. And they asked uh, Jassel if he would ask his friend uh, Patel if she would uh, help him out a bit. So sure enough, uh, Patel wrote to Michael Gove, who was in charge of procurement at that time, 
and she said, I would be most grateful if you could review this matter urgently and work with the company to distribute and supply these masks. Now, a very eminent uh, QC, a gentleman called Sir Geoffrey Jowell, was asked if, if this was a breach of the ministerial code, and he said, and I quote, a government minister who makes representations to another minister with the objective of furthering the financial interests of a former employee and friend without disclosing the collection is in breach of the ministerial code. She's at it again. Now Gove uh, sent the letter on to Hancock. And Hancock replied saying that they couldn't have this contract. It was supposed to be for £20 million, pounds, the contract they wanted, or they'd been talking about with... I couldn't have the contract because it was the wrong type of masks. So Patel came to their defence yet again. She wrote back. PDL have committed stock and secured supply, exposing them to considerable financial risk and pressures. In other words, they'd bought stock for a contract which they hadn't yet got. That's what she's saying. And so Hancock better help them out. Hancock replied that he appreciated uh, the work that PDL had done and had, and I quote, asked his team to liaise directly with PDL. Now, in uh, July, PDL got a contract for £102.6 million for a different type of mask. £102.6 million despite, and I quote again, despite officials within the Department of Health raising concerns that the masks being bought were costing double the benchmark price. Now the benchmark price is the price at which the um, Department of Health would normally be able to buy these things and uh, presumably that price is a price at which you know, anyone supplying should be able to make a profit. So in other words, these are double the price. Half of this contract immediately is surplus profit, pure profit. They've got a £102 million contract, £51 million at least is profit, plus whatever profit they would have made on the deal if they'd supplied at the benchmark price. And they could only do this because the Home Secretary, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Gove, <coughs> and the Secretary of State for Health we're all helping them out. Now, she seemed pretty determined to help this guy out. They're all friends. She probably knows the people who run PDL, I don't know. But isn't it possible, I'll go further that, isn't it almost certain that they'd have seen her right? She's done them a, uh, a favour. She's broke the ministerial code in doing so. She's done them a favour, a big favour, which has resulted in them getting a huge, huge profit of 50, 60, 70 million pounds. Is it not likely that they put a bit aside for her somewhere? Is it not likely maybe five or ten million is in a, uh, an account in the Cayman Islands? Not for now, but for when she resigns, when, she, when she's retired from politics and wants to live it a bit. I raised this again with, with when, when I was talking about uh, Jenrick. You know, the whole point of the Ministry of Code, the whole point of not being able to lobby for the commercial interests of a, a friend or a constituent or whatever, is because if you do so, there's always going to be the suspicion that you're making some money out of it. And this woman's totally unprincipled. She's not a lawless woman, you've seen that. So anyway, that's her involvement in, 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 in PPE. Now, I want to move on to tell you about three things that are happening which are, I think, of great concern. It should be of great concern to all of us. Um, three um, um, Acts of Parliament or three bills that are in different stages. The first is the Police Crime Sentencing and courts bill. Now this is quite a comprehensive bill, quite a complicated bill, lots of things in it. It's uh, now going through the House of Lords, it's gone through the House of Commons, it's uh, halfway through the House of Lords, it will soon become law, very, very shortly. And one of the key uh, aspects of this is that it will 
make it possible for the police, or the Home Secretary for that matter, to stop any demonstration, any peaceful demonstration. You know, the right to be peaceful process is something that's very important. It's a very important civil right, and in any civilised society it, it, it exists. <clears throat> if you don't like something the government's doing or local authorities doing, you can stand out with, outside with, 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 your, with your, um, your posters and your placards, and you can march up and down, and you can complain about it. You can hold meetings in public places and so on. This will give the police uh, the power to ban any of that. And if you resist or if you continue, you're liable to uh, be imprisoned for up to 10 years. It's absolutely draconian. And of course it will frighten a lot of people off ever going to any demonstrations. It's the sort of thing they do in Russia, you know, the sort of thing they do in Myanmar. <coughs> Send the police in to, 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 to break up uh, peaceful demonstrations. People get hurt. Now, when she was presenting this bill to the House of Commons, she said the following. We ask our brave police officers, brave, you see, you have to risk, you have to try and imply that they're going to be at risk if they go and police a, a demonstration. We ask our brave police officers to do the most difficult of jobs. And that is why I have worked closely with the Police Federation in developing this bill. That's what she said to the House of Commons. In response to a Freedom of Information request, the Police Federation said the following. We did not provide a written submission, nor were we consulted on issues of protest-related legislation. She made it up. She hadn't consulted the police. This is her bill. It's not the police. This is her bill. She wants control. Again, she lied to Parliament, a breach of the Ministerial Code. But that happens so often now that uh, it hardly counts. Now there's another, another law she wants to bring in, and it's, uh, it's going to be called the Espionage Act. And this is really, really frightening. I mean, this is 1984, this is really... What she wants to do, and what this Act will do, is to make it a criminal offence to be a whistleblower. In other words, if you work for a government or local government or whatever and you see something that is really bad that you want to tell people about it, <coughs> you can't. You go to prison if you do. And uh, she says uh, also that, she this is a quote from her, press disclosures can be worse than spying. She says that she wants control over what the press writes and if the press are writing anything that uh, the government considers to be um, excessively critical or might uh, be seditious or whatever, that can be punishable by a uh, term of imprisonment. And also in this Act, the government will be able to impose restrictions on individuals, including where they go and who they meet, to be imposed by the executive and not the courts. In other words, if this ever becomes law, the government will be able to decide who you meet and where you go. And if you don't do what you're told, you'll be committing a criminal offence. This is fascism. This is wanting total control. You can't demonstrate. You can't whistle blow. You can't write anything in the papers because it might upset the government. They can tell you who you can meet, who you can't meet. This is fascism. And it's happening. And yet somehow people don't really notice. You know, there's so much else to think about, isn't there? Most people are not very interested in politics. And so this is quietly, quietly going through. This police crime and sentencing bill, the one that... Uh, bans demonstrations, it'll be passed in the next couple of weeks. That'll be law. Even that wonderful Steve Bray, who stands outside Parliament with his blue top hat, shouting about uh, Brexit and has been doing so for all these years, I mean, even he'll be liable to arrest if he makes too much noise. This is really worrying, really, really worrying. Now, finally, I want to talk about her, her pet hate. 
which is immigrants. She really, really seems to hate immigrants. Uh, the immigration policy uh, seems to want to restrict us to in, um, 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 admitting only the brightest and the best. That's the expression they use, isn't it? <clears throat> we don't want any of this riffraff. We don't work at people coming here. We want the brightest and the best. We want, uh, I don't know, physici physicists and physicians and, I don't know, IT experts and all these, these very clever people, the absolute tops. That's the sort of people we want to attract here. I don't think she realises that there's quite a lot of competition for these people. There are a lot of nice countries you can go to. There are places like America you can go to, or you can go to Germany, you can go to Italy, you can go to France, you can go to Japan, you can go to China even. All much more, much less hostile towards foreigners than we have become. None of them failing states as we are. Why are these brightest and best going to be queuing up to get here? But that's not really what concerns her. What concerns her is keeping out ordinary people, particularly Europeans, or above all, the people who come across the channel in these these boats. Now, obviously, we have to have restrictions against immigration. We have to have some sort of controls. We have to do our best to control immigration. Uh, these people who come across the channel, they're, <clears throat> they're pretty miserable. They're pretty poor. They're pretty desperate. But they're the ones she wants to stop because they're embarrassing her because she can't find a way of stopping them. And the fact that there are twice as many coming this year as there were last year is a direct consequence of Brexit. And I'll tell you why. Because when we were members of the EU, the French were obliged to, we were all partners, the French were obliged to do something about, yeah, at least uh, do something to, 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 to stop these people leaving. But now... Why the hell should they? Cali's full of Africans and Arabs hanging around. All they want to do is to leave. All they want to do is get out of there. All the French want is to see the back of them. So why are they going to stop them leaving? Why would they? People like this dope Farage saying the French should do this, the French should do that, the French should keep them. Why is it should be their responsibility? They don't want them. Now last year Patel gave them 31.5 million euros, that's 28, 29 million pounds, to make a bit more effort to stop these people leaving in the little boats. She just announced last week that she's going to give them another 54 million to try and stop the leaving. I can imagine in France they're saying, ha ha ha, 54 million, and next year we'll go for 100 million. You know, the French must think we are real suckers, real suckers. I mean, they're the ones who are gaining from Brexit. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we gave £100 million uh, pounds for, for, for Renault Nissan, 43% owned by Renault, much of it state-owned. Gave them £100 million pounds to set up a battery factory. We're paying this, what now, £85 million pounds to the people in Calais to stop people leaving, which they're not doing. We have loads and loads of uh, British companies going off and setting up in France, employing workers in France, paying taxes in France because they cannot supply from the UK. And then look at the food. Supermarkets are all full of uh, plenty of French cheese, plenty of French wine, no shortage at all of French food in, in, in our supermarkets. You can't send a packet of biscuits to France without being overwhelmed with paperwork. Practically impossible. <coughs> Now this is a problem which, it's, it, it's like the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, it's almost insoluble, it just isn't, isn't possible to solve the problem. But I just want to say something about these people who are coming from, you know, across the, boat, across the channel in, in boats, and I think it's, it's, it's something we should really bear in mind. These people are coming from places like uh, Afghanistan, Eritrea, Sudan, Syria, all these terrible places. <coughs> yeah, they're escaping to, to the, the, their lives are at risk, probably where they come from. Imagine if you're, for example, you're a, a young man and you're 
in uh, Helmand province in, in, in Afghanistan. And the Taliban have uh, killed half the people in your town and maybe some of your relatives. And you're desperate. You're desperate to get away. You're desperate to try and make, make, get somewhere you can try and make a life for yourself. And so you set off for England because perhaps you speak English and perhaps you've got relatives here. And just imagine that journey, how difficult it is from somewhere in remotest Afghanistan to get to Calais with a view to getting to England. Imagine how, how resourceful, how tough, how, how clever you've got to be, how determined you've got to be to go through that sort of journey. And uh, these are the sort of people, these people with such determination, who build nations. These are people who, who will start off and they'll work doing two or three jobs and they'll save some money and they'll start a business because they are just motivated people. They don't get to the shore, the seashore at Dover and get out the rubber dinghy and say, oh, where's the benefits office and how do I get a council flat? What they're saying is, can I get a job? Give me a job, I'll do anything, anything, anything. I'm just so desperately grateful to be here. Please help, please give me a job. But these are all to be, these people are to be demonized. Determined to, uh, to put a stop to all this. She'll never put a stop to it, it's impossible. <coughs> she's determined to put a stop to it and uh, she's tried various things. First of all, she wanted to send them back to Europe. Well, of course, the Europeans said, uh, you must be joking. No, thank you, not sending them back here. And uh, then she uh, had some scheme where she wanted to set up prison camps, uh, um, penal colonies, I think, in, uh, I think it was, was it uh, somewhere in the middle of Africa, anyway, I can't remember exactly where it was, it was Rwanda, somewhere like that. And uh, then I think the United Nations uh, Commission for Human Rights said that was out of the question. It was inhumane and, uh, and cruel. And then she wanted to send them to the Ascension Islands, which is a little island 4,000 miles away in the middle of the Atlantic. I think it was, that was turned down on the grounds that it was too, too expensive. And so uh, what she's going to do now, she's bringing in a new bill. It's called the... Nationality and Borders Bill. It's and at the moment. It's just starting its passage through Parliament. It's in the committee stage of the House of Commons. Now, one of the things that this will do is to enable her to um, to take uh, these people to court as soon as they arrive. They get out the rubber dinghies. They'll be handcuffed and then they'll go to court, and they'll be liable to for four years imprisonment, up to four years imprisonment for having entered illegally. Now this is a very clever idea, isn't it? Very, very clever indeed. So these people come, they're absolutely desperate and they've got here. And uh, instead of helping them, you put them in prison. Our prisons are already bursting at the seams. So this year, for example, if 10,000 people come across the channel, it's 10,000 more people are going to prison. I presume the children will go to what? Children's prisons, I don't know. Well, like the women, I suppose, go to women's prisons. But they'll go in there and they'll spend up to four years mixing with criminals. And then they'll come out and then what? Where are you going to send them then? And they've learnt all about uh, the underworld. What does that achieve? It's crazy. But under this Nationalities and Borders Bill, she has two other rather important amendments of the Immigration Act of 1971, which actually works perfectly OK. Under the uh, Immigration Act of 1971, if you're uh, um, convicted of being a people smuggler, you're liable to imprisonment of up to 14 years. She wants to include and, and she wants to um, increase that to life imprisonment. Now, I don't suppose anybody cares much about that. I mean, these people are just wicked. They're preying on vulnerable and desperate people. I don't suppose anybody cares a jot of they go to prison for life, but it's really not going to make any difference. In the first place, these people are abroad, they're, they're in France or Belgium, wherever they operate from, so you're not likely to catch them. And in the second place, the difference between as a deterrent, 14 years in life is nothing. I mean, it just, it just doesn't, you know, it's, it's just nonsense. It makes no difference whatsoever. What people smugglers are say, oh, if I get caught, I'll get 14 years in prison. Oh, it's worth risking that. Uh, um, but if they make it life in prison, oh, I'll stop doing it altogether. I'll go and get a job. 
It's just nonsense. It's just her. It's just her being tough. Look, I'm going to put them in prison forever. Being tough. Just pointless. But the really sinister and worrying thing about this bill is that it extends it not from people, from people who are um, involved in people smuggling and helping these people for money. It extends it to everybody. Anybody who helps any of these immigrants to enter this country, help them in any way, is liable to imprisonment, with the maximum sense of, 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 of life imprisonment. So this means, and it's, this has been raised uh, quite a lot in the press, if you're out in a little boat, you're out fishing at the weekend uh, off the coast of Kent and you see uh, one of these rubber dinghies and it's sinking and the people are all drowning and the children, there's the children and women there and they're all screaming. And they're if you help them, you're liable to go to prison. You're committing a criminal offence if you help them. What's the point of that? It's just a way for this woman to be tough. She's flapping around like, like Lord Gormel is flapping around trying to sort out the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. I haven't got a clue, really. In her case, she's such a, a vindictive and cruel woman. She'd just do anything to be, just make, just try anything, no matter what the consequences, and regardless of who the people are or, or what their circumstances are that she's, she's affecting. But I want to finish by telling you something that she said, which I think I think tells you everything you need to know about her, and I think it's really, really terrible, and it really, really shocked me. You know how politicians, they'll try and put an idea in your mind, an idea that catches on. It's things like uh, take back control is one of them. Um, they try to put it in your mind, and it's the sort of thing that you you know, people reading the Sun newspaper, for example, will, will, will pass on and talk about it and it will gradually, it will gradually gain currency. Now, if you think of what's the worst, worst possible offence any human being can commit against another, I think it's difficult to argue that there's anything worse than child abuse. And the very, very worst of child abuse is child rape. There is nothing, nothing really worse than child rape. Now, Patel, in talking about this Nationalities and Borders Bill, to the Sun newspaper, she said the following. Our generous safeguards, generous safeguards, our generous safeguards for victims are being rampantly, and I would point out this word rampantly used because that indicates that it's going on everywhere. It's not just very rare incidents, it's everywhere. Rampant. Our generous safeguards for victims are being rampantly abused by child rapists and people who throw, who pose a threat to our national security. What she's trying to put in the mind of some readers, and she probably would have been quite successful in this, is that these desperate people who desperately need help, who arrive on our shores, are not coming here to try and make a new start in life. They're not coming here to try and work and contribute, settle and become members of society in due course. No, they're coming here to rape our children and to bomb us. That's what they're coming for. And of course, as I say, a lot of Sun readers will believe that. They'll be down the pub saying, you know, these half these people coming across the channel, they're rapists, they're child, they rape children. That's how evil this woman is, how wicked she is. This nasty fascist woman. She's trying to convince people that people coming here desperately seeking asylum are child rapists. Now, in response to a Freedom of Information request of the Home Office asking for information to corroborate this suggestion that these people are child rapists and people who throws, pose a threat to our national security, they said uh, 
There is no data to support this. She made it up. Anyway, I'm sorry it's all a bit sombre, and uh, but that's that that's really uh, that's my take on our Home Secretary. <clears throat> I guess I'm probably not going to get invited to a Christmas party, but um, I th I think this really is very very serious. Our, our rights are being taken away. This is what happened in Europe 70 years ago it, you gradually gradually take away your rights you can't you can't you can't uh, demonstrate you can't criticize the government newspapers can't criticize the government you can't whistleblow and this harsh harsh treatment of immigrants it's not really the nation we want to be and uh, I would really urge you to, to 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 tell people about this please refer this this if you think it's appropriate refer this this video to 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 others because I think it's really really important we get this message of, uh, across before it's too late because very soon it's going to be too late this is all happening now so anyway if you watched that far uh, thank you and uh and, and until next time bye for now <laughs>